Dave Smith, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure. Uh, as I was saying, you become a part of my sense-making apparatus, and so getting a chance to sit down with people uh, that have helped me think through some tough issues is always a lot of fun. So thanks for taking the time. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And like I told you before, it's a, it's a bad comment on the state of affairs when I'm the one making sense, but I do appreciate that. That's hilarious. Uh, let me ask, when you were talking to Tucker Carlson, you said that you were terrified for the future of our nation. What exactly are you worried about? Well, I mean, what, you know, I got two little kids, so that's what really makes me scared. If I, if I was still like single and childless, I think I'd be much more just like, oh, this is a fun ride. Let's see where this ends. But I, I don't feel that way The uh, now that I'm just an old nervous dad. Um, I, look, I mean, there's a mix of a lot of things, I guess, uh, that, that all seem to be kind of happening at once. So you have, first off, the um, the financial cliff that we're rapidly driving off uh, is is pretty terrifying. Um, there, you know, it's not just the thirty five trillion dollars in debt, or the fact that um, that interest on the debt is now overtaking the budget. But when you really start to get into like the derivatives and how much actual debt there is, how the dollar being the world reserve currency has kind of been propping up this whole thing. And that if those dollars, you know, if forget even those dollars being returned, but if we can't just continue to export pieces of paper, uh, how much, you know, our whole economic system is built off of that is scary. But then at the same time, you also have um, this kind of like really intense um, cultural divide. Uh, I think that cultural and race and sex relations and things like this are just simply much worse in this country than they have been in my life. And, you know, I'm 40 in my life. I think they're, they're certainly at their worst. And then on top of that is if all of that wasn't enough, you have these constant, um, this kind of open, flirtation uh, by the ruling class with some type of like real creepy um, technological neo-fascism. I mean, the the stuff about like a central bank digital currency and, um, you know, all of this kind of like you will own nothing and be happy. And, you know, that like the, the worst of the clips that come out of like WEF forums, which are, I, I understand aren't exactly, you know, guaranteed to be the law of the land anytime soon, but it's still enough to be kind of creeped out by that. All of this happening with the rise of AI and how advanced the kind of um, uh, the spying apparatus of the federal government has become, uh, you know, with all of that, I think there's more than a little bit to be concerned about. Oh, and I didn't yeah, mention World uh, War Three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one. How how real do you think that is? Like, is that, are we actually flirting with World War III or is that just the sort of um, skull and bones that we're meant to avoid? Well, there's a, um, was a, a Jason Stapleton was a very bright guy. He once said, and I really liked that. He said, never, uh, never bet all your chips on the end of the world because you're only going to be right once. And when you are, it won't matter. Uh, so I'm not saying, you know, that this is that we're going to be in, in a world war. Hopefully we're not. I do. I am. And, and I'm somebody who kind of focuses on the corruption of the ruling class for, you know, a, a lot more of my life than the average person does. But I have been absolutely stunned by the recklessness of the the policy of the Biden administration since the war in in Ukraine broke out like there is it, there seems to be no considering uh of the possibility that like we are risking so much for such an unspecified goal um you know victory whatever that means exactly uh for Ukraine and the fact that even over the last uh couple months now, I mean, there's been more and more signals, I guess, for more than just a couple months, these signals that 
the regime in D.C. will support Ukraine striking inside of Russia and then even supporting as the war moves inside of Russia's borders. And this is simply unlike anything, even in the Cold War. And if you know your Cold War history, like we actually play, came pretty close to nuclear war on a couple of occasions. And it was only through communications at the highest levels that we were able to avoid that. And these days they openly brag that they're not communicating at all. And so I, th I, I just I think it's so crazy to be involved in a proxy war on Russia's border. Um, and no, I'm not saying it's we're going to all die in a nuclear war, but the fact that we would even tolerate upping the the risk of that for no strategic advantage whatsoever is been pretty wild to see. So what's your thesis on that? So I tend to assume that while I may have wildly divergent values from the people in power, I don't think them stupid. So is it that they're dumb or is there an agenda that we're unaware of that makes them say, uh, hey, don't worry, we're not going to move NATO an inch east. Oh, P.S. Uh, we just keep marching east like nine minutes after making that statement. Um I mean, I, you know, I guess it, it'd be comforting to kind of believe that, no, there is some real wisdom there and they actually have a plan and know better. Um, I, I, I got to say, I think that at least amongst the political class, uh, this is more or less how I see it, right? So amongst the political class, I think what you have for the most part, as you may have noticed, is like the same generation of politicians as when I was a kid, for the most part. I mean, I know they just had to swap Biden out. They had to swap Biden out for Kamala Harris. But, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden, who's the president of the United States, presumably, um, th they are all kind of came up during the unipolar moment. Um, maybe, maybe they came up a little before that, but then they were really all in power in that moment. And th I'm referring to was what Charles Krautenhammer called the unipolar moment after the, the Soviet Union collapsed. And I think that being in this moment was unlike anything else in human history, a, a truly like a one dominant global empire with, a, you know, military and technological capabilities, unlike anything that any country had ever had. And there was essentially no, there was no counter force. And so they were kind of allowed to do whatever they wanted to, or they were able to do whatever they wanted to. And I do think that this bred a very unimpressive group of political leaders. Uh, it, it's breathtaking. If you go back and listen to political speeches that were given by Eisenhower or Jack Kennedy, and just think about how much, not only how much smarter those guys were, but how much smarter they presumed their audience, the American people were. And listen to, you know, political speeches from today. It's like, I mean, just watching the Democratic National Convention uh, over the last few days, it's unbelievable how dumb the whole thing is. Uh, forget whether you lean left or right. And this is true for the Republicans too. Whether you lean left or right, everything has gotten so freaking dumb. And the more I look at this, I'm like, no, I don't think these politicians have some master plan. I don't think that behind the scenes, Kamala Harris is like a, a genius or Joe Biden is a genius and they have some plan. I think they are really unimpressive. They're they're essentially the the old saying of born on third base and felt like you hit a triple. Like they feel like they built this the greatest power in the history of the world when they didn't. They just inherited it. And then who who you have who's really pulling the strings are essentially big business interests and they are very smart but they're very smart and motivated at making money and so like you know if you're it, like all that talk about nato expansion i mean that was a if you were just somebody in a weapons company who's trying to figure out how to make more profits. And you're like, listen, we're going to fund these think tanks that advocate for NATO expansion. And then we're going to lobby these politicians to get this NATO expansion. Well, it was a great deal for you. You got to sell weapons to like a much, much bigger market than you would have before. So I think there is like a, an intelligent plan going on, but it's not, you know, not one that's like on behalf of the American people. 
Do you think that this is all ultimately just a question of money? No, not entirely. Uh, no one thing is ever completely the answer. So, I mean, I think money, I think business explains a lot, explains a lot of it. Um, no, but there is, there's ideology at work also. Um, and certainly I think that like the, the neoconservatives, I think certainly had an ideology about what, what should be done in the, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and how we should have, as they called it, a project for a new American century. I, I think there, there were, there are true believers in that group. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly with some of the other stuff, you know, like my, my gut, not that I, I know this for sure, I can't read people's minds, but my gut is that a lot of the progressive Democrats, the Democratic elite type, don't really believe in a lot of the ideology that they espouse. I mean, I, I don't believe that Joe Biden is really concerned about trans issues or something like that. I just, I, I don't buy that. I don't think anybody who's 80 is <laughs> really like, I just, I don't buy that they're really concerned about trans issues. Um, but I do think that there are like neoconservatives who really believe in their hawkish foreign policy view. And I do think that there are, there are people in DC, you know, like human beings are a weird species. It's it. If all of your sent incentives dictate that you believe something, most of the times human beings aren't just going, ha, 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 I'll be evil and act out my incentives, even though I know they're wrong. We have a tremendous capacity to like convince ourselves that the thing that's good for us is actually the correct move. So I'm sure there are some people in DC who really believe in like, you know, some peace through strength or we got to go, you know, confront Iran or something like that. I, you know, I'm sure there were people who really believed that, uh, if, if we toppled Saddam Hussein, democracy would sweep the region and people can convince themselves of all types of nonsense. I have a, a theory that is, it'll be interesting to hear what you think. So, um, I think that when you view this all through the lens of power, like the will to power, like Nietzsche's will to power, it all starts making sense. Um, when you look at it through the lens of money, it actually makes less sense. There's clearly money involved, but I think money through the lens of, again, the will to power that somebody can use that money to be in control, that makes sense. Uh, so what it looks like to me, even when I look at Russia, is um, having, I'm old enough to remember the height of the Cold War. I remember one of my neighbors asking me if I thought we were all gonna die from a nuclear blast I was uh, a kid perfectly timed for the movie Red Dawn, where it isn't specifically Russia, but that's obviously what it's meant to be. They just paratrooper in, uh, take over a town. I used to have a recurring nightmare about Red Dawn actually happening. Um, and so I think uh, when I play out the following scenario, a, a lot of things make sense. You have uh, the old guard still in, in control. They lived through all of that. They knew what that was. It felt like an unbelievably jubilant moment when we tore down the Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union collapses. Uh, it just felt like, man, this is America, really the ideal of freedom and capitalism has won over communism and tyranny. This is uh, a fantastic moment. Unipolar, let's make the most of being the only power. Uh, and we are the good guys. And so let's go do what good guys do and, and bring democracy to the rest of the world. Now, where that starts to read is like, okay, this is really just the, the cover story for my will to power. That gets cloudy. Like you said, some people probably convince themselves of it. Other people may be purely cynical. It almost doesn't matter. It's okay, we won. We are now going to um, use our influence. We clearly will pitch it as benevolent. And then it becomes a question of, okay, if, if that's what we're doing and this is the old war and now we're pushing NATO up closer to Russia, if we're having PTSD essentially of when there really was parity between us and Russia economically, um, I get why they want to keep Russia weak Somehow, some way, they don't realize that when you topple a regime, it seems almost universally that something worse comes into power. But when I run that thought experiment, everything I see clicks into place. Do you think there's anything missing in that assessment? 
Well, I, uh, you know, I, again, I don't think it's necessarily one or the other. I mean, I think the will to power is certainly um, a, a major factor. And, and human psychology, of course, is a, is a factor with all people is, and, and powerful people don't escape that. And there have been like some studies on this done and stuff of like the drug that is power and p- human beings are, you know, genetically hardwired to desire power and status and all of these things. And, and I've even seen it like, uh, just in my little bit of experience in like the corporate media, it's, it's amazing how much these people are driven by the fact that, you know, they, they got a phone call from a Senator and they're going to be at a cocktail party with the fed chairman. And like they're little like status, things like that mean a lot to people. And I'm sure everybody listening could think of examples of that just with regular people. They know, you know, like within their little company or where, whatever. Um, I, I would say, though, that I think along with so I don't disagree with anything you said, but I think along with that, there was, um, you know, so if you if you go back and read Bill Buckley from like in, in the 50s there, he, even back then he was writing and like in right after World War Two about how, look, we essentially, the conservative movement, it probably wasn't called that yet, but essentially the conservative movement, he was like, look, we believe in limited government and, you know, the constitution and being a normal country. The problem is we have the Soviet Union. And because we have the Soviet Union, we have to all be cold warriors right now. He actually said we have to embrace a totalitarian dictatorship in our own shores in order to fight off. You can go look this up. In order to fight off the totalitarian dictatorship abroad, we have to create our own military and industrial complex is essentially his argument. And this was the entire justification for this gigantic um, honeypot. I mean, not just NATO, but like the entire military industrial complex budget, the justification was NATO. And as soon I'm sorry, the justification was the Soviet Union. And as soon as the Soviet Union collapses, I think there is this collective freak out from a whole bunch of people who now have to justify their job. I, I mean, like what, you know, like even just the existence of NATO didn't make sense anymore. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, they were an organization to defend against Soviet aggression. Well, there's no more Soviet Union. And for the, you know, there, there were lots of people, um, some liberals and some conservatives and some like even in positions of power or influence who were like, oh, OK, great. The Soviet Union fell. So now we can have a big cut in defense spending. I mean, this was the justification for how high it was. And now we can return to being a normal country. There was a lot of talk of a peace dividend. Uh, and you can read this in the uh, the neoconservative writing in the 90s, where they were all like very concerned about this, that they're like, oh, man, like even up to like 96, when Bob Dole was running, and they're all, uh, they're, they're all kind of writing like, oh, man, like, there's this, there's such an appetite in America to worry about our own issues. Like, whatever, we don't have to worry about running the whole world. Now we can like kind of focus on issues that we have here at home. And when there is that type of uh, environment, I do think it makes you find a lot of people going, oh, well, look, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. OK, this is a huge thing. We have to go down because if that's a huge thing, then all of a sudden your existence is justified again. And so I, I just do think there is also like a, a money element to it, however that plays out psychologically that it's like oh there's the, you know there is a thing where uh, you see this all over the place i mean if there's if if there's a whole like movement to let's say or different organizations um to combat racism well what do you do when america becomes a much less racist country than it used to be do you go all right boys time to close up shop we're all done here or do you just turn up the hysteria and go well we found five more incidences of racism, even though they all turn out to be hoaxes or exaggerated or something like that. And so I think that's kind of what happened with the military industrial complex with NATO with all of this, it's like their reason for existing disappeared. And then they were like, well, we got to replace that with something else. And much like with the racism stuff, the less of it that there organically is, 
the more you have to embellish and the crazier you have to become because you have to, you know, it's like, oh, so this NASCAR guy got a noose hung in his driveway. And you're like, wait, that doesn't seem plausible. It's like, well, I don't know. We got to find something because no one's really fighting about this stuff. And so I think a lot of that is what happened after the fall of the Soviet Union. That's uh, that's very interesting. A lot of confluence. Um, I want to go back to what you were saying about Bill Buckley. There's something interesting there. The impulse to rule the world is something that I find um, I find myself constantly wanting to push back on people who I think trust themselves too much. What do you make of the impulse that? And I I I never know what name to give this. The elites, the anointed class, whatever. We need a, a better name for um, the sort of psychological organizing principle that they all fall under. But it's the sense of the nanny state. There are some people that are smart. This is what I think is their operating system. There are some people that are smart. There are some people that are dumb. We are the smart people. We have to protect the dumb people. There's certainly a, a, an amount of arrogance there. It isn't just uh, we want to help. It's we're superior and I don't want to have to deal with your dumb ideas. So shh, little boy, be quiet and just do as you're told. Um, but what do you make of the fact that these incredibly intelligent people can say we need a dictatorship on our own shores? Well, it was, uh, to, to be clear, not a dictatorship, but he said a, uh, a totalitarian bureaucracy was, uh, was his term. So, but, um, so well, much better. I, I mean, honestly, you know, with, with Bill Buckley, um, I mean, the guy did work for the CIA and then supposedly left and then came out and said this stuff. So I'm uh, like, I'm uh, certainly open to the possibility that that was just a CIA operation to like keep the whole thing going. Um, in, in terms of broad, like to your broader question. Yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of why the Lord of the Rings was such a, you know, a brilliant uh example of this is that it's like it's even for people who really want to destroy the ring of power it's tough once you get a hold of it I and mean, once you get a hold of it i mean come on like i mean if you could remake the world in your image wouldn't your image be better than you know than anyone else's and it's very easy to rationalize that away and to go, well, if I don't do this, someone else is going to do it and they'll do it much worse. I mean, I, I hear that rationalization constantly when defending the American empire that it's like, well, I mean, Hey, if we didn't do it, China would do it. So therefore whatever we're, it's better. It's gotta be better with us than with them. And you know, it's very easy to, to feel that way. And it's very rare. This is why George Washington is like, uh, you know, revered. Because it's very rare when there are people who even, and Washington had a lot of flaws, but he could have been a king and he chose not to be. And that in itself is so rare that people are like, whoa, that's incredible. The idea that someone would have turned down power that they could have had. And perhaps it's true that almost any country in the position that the United States of America was in the 90s would have probably done the same thing that if you had this opportunity to to rule the world who's really going to turn that down and or at least it would be the rarest of of men who would turn that down because they were like no listen this isn't it's not the right thing to do and it's not in our long term interest so yeah i think i think the the desire to rule the world is something that's existed for a long time and there's there's no question i mean look you don't really even have to um read between the lines too much to look just you know listen to anything in the g7 summits or the wef or something like that it's like yeah they're all talking about ruling the world i mean they're all they're talking about what temperature it should be outside in a hundred years and how they're going to legislate what the what the temperature can be in the year you know uh, whatever in the year, a hundred years from now, or whatever. And so it's uh, it, it's pretty. I mean, they're talking about global regulations. I mean, what is this? Rules for the entire world to follow. It's clearly they're animating. You know, like the animating uh, characteristic there is a desire for global domination. There is a revolution happening in nutrition. It lets you eat like a fitness model, save time like a CEO, and enjoy meals like a food critic. It's called Factor. Every week, you get to choose from 35 different meals and over 60 add-ons. We're talking restaurant-quality dishes featuring premium ingredients like filet mignon and blackened salmon. 
Factor takes care of everything. Shopping, prepping, cooking. All you do is heat and eat. Head to factormeals.com slash impacttheory50 and use code impacttheory50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code impacttheory50 at factormeals.com slash impacttheory50. And that gets you 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Life moves fast. You're rushing from meeting to meeting, stuck in traffic, or racing to meet project deadlines. These are the moments when nutrition ends up getting shoved into the backseat, leaving you hungry, unfocused, and reaching for, instead of something good for you, whatever is convenient. But convenience doesn't have to mean sacrificing your health. That's where fuel comes in. Huel is a complete meal designed for your busiest days. It packs 40 grams of protein, 27 essential vitamins and minerals, and it needs zero prep time. With flavors like chocolate and vanilla, Huel is like a milkshake that's actually good for you. Over 400 million Huel meals have been consumed worldwide. Ready to fuel your busiest days? Here's an exclusive offer for Impact Theory listeners. Get 15% off with code IMPACT at Huel. Dot com. That's Huel, H-U-E-L dot com, and use code IMPACT for 15% off. And why is it a bad idea if they really have the right answers? Why is one global government a bad idea? Well, number one, because they don't have the right answers. And look, I mean, even if you, even if they did, um, I mean, the, if you were to set up a one world government, well, all it takes is one government going bad now, and the entire world is ruined, you know? And so this is the, the, the like, decentralization of power and liberty go hand in hand. And you, you really never have one without the other. And the idea that even if you were to put the most perfect angels in, tar in, in charge of the world, it's like the old Lord Atkin, you know, concept that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so the idea that any group of men are capable of ruling the world and not being corrupted is at best highly unlikely, at worst completely impossible. And in the event that they are corrupted, if you have one uh, world government, then you're in the you're in the nightmare scenario, which is that everybody lives under a totalitarian regime. All right. So during the Cold War, when we actually had two opposing forces, uh, it did not feel safe. In fact, I would say it certainly for Americans. Uh, it has felt way safer in a unipolar moment, but I've heard you say that unipolarity is the problem. Uh, is that only true because there are so many people that are not Americans, or is the unipolar moment actually bad for Americans ourselves? Well, I think it's very, I mean, it's very bad for the American people, broadly speaking. It's probably been very good for Washington, D.C. and for, you know, giant corporations who are connected to Washington, D.C. Um, and and I think there is some truth to the fact that there it, there was a danger, the danger of nuclear war um, was higher in the Cold War than immediately after the Soviet Union fell. I think now because of these awful policies and backing Ukraine, we've we've brought that risk back. Um, so that's not good. The the thing is that that what the unipolar moment allowed was for America to go on a, a type of global adventurism that they would not have been able to get away with. Um, beforehand. And there's a reason why we didn't do anything like the terror wars before the Soviet Union collapsed, because there, there was a counterweight to us. There was a counterbalance to some degree. And so what you see after the Soviet Union collapses is like this tremendous expansion in American warfare, in American spending and debt and money printing and all of this stuff. And I think that that has been very bad for the nation. It's been very bad for the people in general. And so that's that's what I meant by saying that the unipolar moment was kind of a disaster for the American people. Um, that doesn't mean that the Cold War is good. There were terrible things that happened during the Cold War. Um, but 
you know, if you just look at, say, like in a 20 year period, roughly speaking, a little more than 20 years, the fact that America's fought a war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, um, in Libya, in Syria, in Somalia, in Yemen, and in Niger, and Pakistan with the drone bomb campaigns. I mean, there simply just wasn't any, there wasn't anything quite like that during the Cold War, even with Vietnam and the war in Korea and stuff like that. It wasn't like just war, 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 war in a 20 year period with this many people dying and this much money wasted and this much of a region of the world totally destabilized. And I don't think you would have that in a non unipolar world. So that I think has been the real disaster of all of this. And how do you see us getting out of um, the unipolar moment? Obviously for us, there, there would be a, a potential economic defeat that goes hand in hand with that. So if it's bad for us, but the solution is potentially worse than the disease, what do we do about that? Well, I mean, the, we're, we're the way we actually are getting out of it is that we are, you know, kind of uh, spending ourselves into debt while pissing off a lot of the rest of the world. And now they're starting to ally with each other. So that's what's actually playing out. This is probably the least responsible way to end the unipolar moment. But I guess what I would just say is like, kind of the message of optimism in all of this is that what that moment allowed America to become, and it's not just that moment. I mean, there's several other major factors. Um, being uh, go, Nixon taking us off the gold standard is a huge one that we're, we're now. We were also like perfectly positioned. It was like 20 years after we went off the gold standard, the Soviet Union collapses. So now not only are we the world empire, but we also have this fiat currency machine where we can just print up as much money as we want to. Um, really nothing to kind of check government excess. Um, but I don't think, you know, like I, uh, I think that both logically we, we can kind of deduce this from the best economic thinkers and also just empirically, you can look at the 20th and even the 21st century and kind of see that like what actually creates wealth is, um, free markets, cooperation, voluntary trade. And what the government class is, is parasitic in nature. They take from productive people by force or by the threat of force, and they uh, redistribute that money to people who aren't producing. And I'm not saying that like, I'm not saying like, when I, I'm not even thinking like these lazy bums on welfare, I'm thinking like these billionaires on welfare. Um, but the, the idea that like drastic cuts in government spending or something like that, or like a drastic reduction in the power of Washington, D.C. over the rest of the world, I don't think that would really hurt um, Americans. I mean, obviously, the transition might be a, a bit wild, and that's never the best thing. But ultimately, I think that on the other side of that is that the, the American empire is a, a weight on the back of the American taxpayer. And so ultimately, I think that if that were to be greatly reduced, there would be a huge improvement in the liberty and the prosperity of regular people in this country, which is, I think, what we should all care about a lot more than, you know, those poor weapons manufacturers. Uh, so when you lay out that vision for what we're doing now that's taking us in the wrong direction i don't see a way to reverse that pain and suffering so um do you see any way for us to get out of our debt spiral uh get out of our addiction to spending money we don't have by printing uh, to not need the wars to keep GDP pumped sky high so that we can justify the amount of money that we're pumping into the system. Um, do you see a realistic way to reverse that? Or, because this is how it feels to me, I am watching something that plays out in a really predictable debt cycle that Ray Dalio tracks. And it's, it's, I don't want to be defeatist, but it does feel a bit like the emoji where you sit back with your popcorn and you just watch what unfolds because I don't see a way to pump the brakes. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly get your point, and I, I have that feeling at times as well. I think, like, one of the things that really keeps me encouraged is that all of this stuff, like, uh, all, as with all government authoritarian policies, all relies on propaganda. Um, it's very important to the powers that be that they are able to propagandize their citizenry and convince them of things that are not true to be true in order to justify whatever the government policy is. And one of the things that we are living through right now that we're kind of participating in right now um, is that we live in a whole new world now where the state's monopoly on the control of information has been broken really for the first time. And there are shows now like yours that, that have a huge audience, way, way bigger than what a lot of the corporate media outlets uh, are getting these days. And that the, the propaganda can totally be challenged. This is something that's just very different than in the past. And so that gives me a, a lot of optimism as far as the actual system. Um, you know, look, related to my first point, people are so much more aware of how corrupt the system is now than they've ever been before. People are so much more aware of the deep state and the dishonesty of the corporate media and how much wars are started based off lies um, to the point that everything is almost questioned now and that leads to other problems, but I think uh, in, in total, the, the positives outweigh the negatives. And so how does the whole thing, how does this unsustainable thing get unraveled? I don't know exactly, but I would say that there's, you know, using the example of the Soviet Union, I mean, there was a big, powerful government that controlled half of Europe and chunks of the rest of the world, and the whole thing was gone. And not too many experts predicted 10, 15 years before the collapse of the Soviet Union that it would be gone at the, uh, by the early 90s. And so it is, you know, I think that the, the future always holds, um, uh, I wouldn't say unlimited possibilities, but certainly many more possibilities than any of us are smart enough to foresee. And that I don't think it's that crazy that you would have some type of radical transformation in the United States of America. I mean, we've already had a radical transformation in this country just in the last 30 years. The, this is a much different country than what I grew up in in the 90s. And I think that we're living through some pretty incredible times. There's a massive um, awakening and realignment happening right now. And so I do, I, I like to stay optimistic that we could see something like a, a radical decentralization of power in this country um, and something that could make it a much, a much better, freer place. Okay. Interesting. I definitely want to hear about the uh, decentralization, what you mean about that. I know a little bit about your background as a libertarian, uh, but first I want to address what I'll consider the elephant in the room. So if you're most worried about um, world war three, the thing I'm most worried about is that the debt cycle that we're in is is man it as close to inevitable as you're going to get and i forget the exact percentage but it's like 84 percent of the time it ends in war uh because what for people that um aren't paying attention a lot to economics the debt cycle works something like this uh usually you just had a war and because you just had a war all the debt is wiped off the table and um, everybody starts over, the tables turned over and people start building up from scratch. Now, people don't have a lot, but they also don't have a lot of debt. And so now you get into this accumulation phase and it becomes the, the party time and people start bringing on debt. Uh, they discover that they can print money, especially if you're the reserve currency like we are, where you can literally uh, spread your losses internationally uh, through uh, inflation. You're just adding money to the money supply. We don't have to get super deep on that right now. But um, you keep building up that debt bubble. You keep bringing on debt, both personally at the governmental level, at the corporate level. And it gets to the point where we are right now, where even just servicing the interest on the debt becomes next to impossible. So you are in a situation where you have two options before you. You can hyperinflate your currency because to make good on your debts, 
you will have to. You you literally, even if you taxed everybody at 100%, you would not be able to meet your obligations. So you either have to hyperinflate the currency or you have to default. And the only option that you have out of those, historically speaking, is war. And so it can be a revolution or it can be a, a World War One, Two, Three. And when I look at the numbers that America is putting up on the board, I'm like, you have an inevitability that you have to deal with. So when I hear an idea like, hey, we decentralize this, I don't know yet if I love that idea or hate it, I'll have to hear more about it. But we have to deal with the debt. Like there must be a debt jubilee in here somehow. And so you'll hear people say that maybe the closest thing to the debt jubilee is going to be AI, that AI and robotics, they basically are like an untapped continent that we suddenly discover, hey, and it's effectively free labor. It's complicated as to why that would work, but it would work. Um, but barring that, I don't see a happy path out of this. What, what do you see? Yeah. Okay. So first I would just point out that look in, uh, in 1971, as I mentioned, Richard Nixon getting us off the gold standard, that was a, a default. I mean, that's, they, they painted it in, you know, a, a different way, but that's 100% what that was, is that we had said, Hey, world, here, that was the Bretton Woods agreement, right? Was that will be the world, uh, the world reserve, you can peg your currency to the dollar, and you can redeem your dollar anytime you want uh, $35 an ounce for an ounce of gold. And then when the French wanted to come redeem it, Nixon was like, No, no, we're not giving it to you. We don't have it. It was a big giant default. They just spun it as like, the French are trying to undermine dollar stability or something like that. But it was like, yeah, but this was the deal that they were allowed to do it. And anyway, so we certainly, um, I I'd say that a couple things on that. Um, number one, I think default is the best answer. So I think you're essentially right that you either have default or you have um hyperinflation default or inflation and at this point with the level of debt we have it would be hyperinflation um default is not all sunshine and roses but it's a lot better than hyperinflation and it's a lot better than starting a war to get yourself out of it the thing that does encourage me a little bit is that you know oftentimes you'll hear the political class talk about how divided we are and that's certainly true but they talk about how awful it is that we're so divided. Um, th whoever their candidate is, is always supposed to be a uniter. Um, they also talk about the problems with fake news and all of this stuff. And I think what's there, there's an admission of truth that's buried underneath there, which is that it, it would be really, really hard for them to recreate, say, 2002. Um, in, in 2002, for people who are uh, old enough to remember, as I am, um, there was a steady war beat, uh, a steady war drums beat for the war in Iraq. We didn't invade till 2003, but all of 2002 was spent laying the groundwork so that you would have to be crazy to not know that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons and he was in on 9-11 and he's about to pass these nuclear weapons off. You know, he's about to pass the weapons he doesn't have off to the terrorists he's not really friends with and they're going to nuke Kansas. This is just a matter of time. Literally, the vice president, Dick Cheney, says it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And they, and they got large enough levels of support for the war in Iraq that they were able to pull it off. And back then, the New York Times was selling it, CNN was selling it, Fox News was selling it. I mean, they just, they, all powerful sources of information all got behind this war push. And of course, there was a tremendous, um, as there is now, but even a stronger push to demonize anybody who was critical of the war. If you weren't with George W. Bush, you were with the terrorists. They could not pull anything like that off today. And I think that's why they're so upset that we're, uh, you know, that we're uh, not unified. Because when the time comes, if you really want to sell a war, what you're going to need is a massive propaganda campaign, and you're going to need to get at least a large enough percentage of your population behind your war that you feel comfortable enacting the policy. And today, we have Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson and like all of these people who are like way, way bigger than 
the entire propaganda apparatus itself. And they, if they were trying to lie us into war again, those guys would be the first ones exposing it on their show. And so that does give me a little sense of hope that I don't know how easy it would be for them to pull off the, you know, leading us into a next war based off lies. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's impossible and they couldn't do it and there wouldn't be some say, type of... Based on that assumption, do you think if we had a... Uh, COVID V2, that we wouldn't be lied into submission with that. I think it would be much harder to do it again than it was the the first time. Um, you know, they, they tried to float out another round of lockdowns, like kind of late into COVID. And it was just like, thoroughly, you know, they do these things where they put out like trial balloons, you know, there'll be like articles about like, well, you know, Joe Biden is considering a national vaccine passport. And then like, everybody's up in arms. And they're like, no, 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 no we weren't going to do that. No problem. Like, they're always testing the waters. Uh, this happens a lot. And I think that, again, it's not that it's impossible. Um, but it would be much, much harder to do COVID again than it was the first time because, a you know, a, a not insignificant percentage of the population now recognizes that they were duped and and now also doesn't trust any of the people who sold that to them. Um, so I think it it's not impossible, but it would certainly be a lot harder. Okay, so... Um... If we were going to get across this chasm somehow, we unwind the debt in some way that hopefully isn't wildly traumatic. Um, talk to me about what does decentralized power look like? I'm assuming your answer will come from a libertarian framework. So if you can give me the, um, the rubric by which you're coming to the conclusion of why this is better, uh, I would love to understand that. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's look, I, I think it's very consistent with kind of the founding documents of the United States of America and with like the, the basic premise being that man ought to be free and that government is an instrument of force. And if government is to exist, its only legitimate function is the protection of liberty. Um, the, decentralization it could be on a spectrum. I mean, it, it could mean um, secession and a national divorce of, of some sort in the most extreme form. But it also could just mean strong federalism, something that is still enshrined in the Constitution, but we do not have at all anymore in this country. But the, you know, there's, um, I think there's a thing, some lawyer told me this once, but they said that on the bar, if, uh, if there's a multiple choice and the answer is the 10th Amendment, they say that's always wrong. Like you never pick the 10th amendment if that's the answer, because that's just never how things actually work. But we do have an amendment to the constitution that says, Hey, like anything not expressly given to the federal government here doesn't belong to them. Then that's for the States and for the people. And I think that uh, particularly when you have such strong cultural divisions in the country, the you're going to be like the idea that, okay, we're going to have an election every four years and then whoever wins rules over you. So if my team wins, then, you know, whatever, it's rural Alabama rules over Portland or, or Portland rules over rural Alabama. Well, that makes no sense on any level. And that's certainly not a recipe for liberty. And so what's much better is to just accept that, hey, there are many different cultures in this country and that they they should not get to impose their wills on others. It's really, if you think about it, right, the same, it's just the logical conclusion of what I was saying before in, in opposing one world government. I mean, if you're not for one world government and you go, well, no, we have to have more competition, well, then why shouldn't we just have a little bit more and a little bit more? And ultimately, I think that the more kind of decentralized power is, the more likely you are to have a free, prosperous society. It's not, it's not a coincidence that the United States of America was such a successful country and the model that it was started off of was being these united states. Like they're, they're all together in a union, but there's all of these different little states um, that all have their own constitutions. And I think particularly today, as, as you've seen over the 20th century, but really drastically in the 21st century, the a lot of the problems we're facing are the centralization of power in Washington, D.C. And 
what the antidote for that would be a decentralization of power. Hmm. It's really interesting. There's a story about Robert E. Lee uh, originally not wanting to join the Confederate Army. Uh, he was considering going to the um, North, and he ultimately was like, ah, I'm just more loyal to my state than I am to my country. And I thought, whoa, that's not something that you would hear a lot of today. Um, so heard, understand that. Um, out of curiosity, where do you think, like is 50 states and a geographic region as big as the United States, is that the right subdivision? Or would you want to, and, and I'm talking not in theory, in practice, in practice, would you want to see that subdivided farther, much farther? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think um, certainly like 300 plus million people under one government is just way too many people. Um, so I, uh, you know, so again, I know you're asking me not in theory, but in theory, I'd like to see it divided as small down as it could possibly go. I'd be happy to see it divided down to neighborhood blocks. Um, in practice, I would support anything moving in that direction. However, there's, you know, there's also, um, there, there's, a, if we're talking in practice, then there's also the reality that like, okay, the feds might crack down on you. So you want to do this in an intelligent way where you're not going to like, you know, have your community invaded and, and dominated and brought back into the larger polity. Um, but, but I do think that any of those uh, types of, um, any of those types of divisions are good. I think that if, uh, it, it's probably not anytime soon going to come in the form of secession, but anything where uh, Texas just takes a little bit more power for Texas to regulate themselves than the federal government or, you know, or, or California or whoever, I think that's a step in the right direction. The business world is changing at light speed. Market shifts, AI revolution, rising global tension. A lot of businesses are struggling to keep up but some are also thriving. So what are the ones that are thriving doing? They're using NetSuite by Oracle. Over 38,000 forward-thinking businesses use it to turn rapid change into fuel for growth. With NetSuite, you get one source of truth, real-time insights, and closed books in days, not weeks. So if you're serious about turning uncertainty into opportunity, NetSuite is the tool to do it. Speaking of opportunity, download the CFO's Guide to AI and Machine Learning at netsuite.com slash theory. The guide is free to you at netsuite.com slash theory. That's netsuite.com slash theory. Um, there's a book called Infomocracy. Uh, and it contemplates a world that's kind of like Balaji. I don't know if you know Balaji, but Balaji Srinivasan is a guy that talks about something called the network state. I, man, you, you will have a very strong reaction to him. I think you'll like him, um, but you definitely should look him up at, at, at a minimum. Anyway, this book, uh, The uh, Infomocracy, toys with some of the same ideas of Balaji's idea of the network state where people really self-organize. They form essentially governments. His thing is that it's not necessarily geographically uh, that people will orient around. It will be around a value system where they connect to each other over the network. Um, but even if you take that to be geographic, but it hyper fragments, like you were saying, down into the neighborhood, that's what this book contemplates. It's a fiction book, but it did give me a sci-fi glimpse into what a hyper uh, decentralized world would look like. And if I'm honest, it seemed just unbearably burdensome to have to worry about what's legal and not legal a block away from you. And so even if you're just like walking to uh, a mall, which doesn't happen to be on your block, uh, you might have to pass through three different, you know, block states. And I was just like, oh my God, like that seems like an absolute nightmare. Now I have tried to wrap my head around, uh, and you're, you have not said the word anarchist, so I, I don't want to paint you with this brush, but I've tried to wrap my head around some, um, uh, anarchist principles from talking with Michael Malice. And it's one of those where I get it at the idea stage, but I am left asking, looking at societies as like a 
what we see is is the result of many civilizations, city states, countries, everything going through a long term evolutionary process, and they all seem to end in roughly the same place. And I'm just curious, why don't we see large scale, um, truly libertine groupings? Is there something about it that doesn't scale? Well, I mean, okay, so just to, at the end there, I mean, I, I wouldn't be arguing for libertine uh, groupings much as uh, just for libertarian groupings, which uh, there is an Sorry, important is there a distinction difference? there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, libertine usually comes with a connotation of more like free love uh, and that type of stuff. Ah. But so I would <laughs> I, I would say this. So um, first, of all, Michael Mal's a very good friend of mine, and I do uh, essentially agree with him that I do. I think that the ultimate goal should be a voluntary society. And if you think about how essentially your, your interactions with everybody in your life, every type of business interaction and personal, every business relationship, every personal relationship you have in your life, down to the very, very complex ones, are all completely voluntary except for your relationship with criminals and the government. Criminals in the government are the only relationships that you'll ever have in your life where it is literally at the threat of violence, you are forced to do something. You're going to do something because they will throw you in jail if you don't do it. They will ruin your life if you don't do it. They will shut down your business if you don't do it. And then, of course, if you happen to be unfortunate enough to interact with like criminals and they pull out a gun and say, give me your wallet, that's also, uh, you know, a, a relationship predicated on force. Everything else is voluntary. This podcast right now we have is a voluntary reaction. You know, your people reached out to my people and we set it up. We're across the United States of America right now. There's also a voluntary relationship with our internet providers, with the people who we bought our, our, our microphones and computers and all of this stuff with all of this. And it's pretty complex. Um, and there really it does not seem to be any obvious reason to me why but I mean, we all certainly recognize that our relationships with criminals are unnecessary and the goal should be to have as little of them as possible. And it's not self-evident to me why, but the government must be this monopoly of force and that all the services, like all of these incredibly complex services um, from, you know, like whatever, the, I don't even know what half of the technology I have in front of me is here because other people who I trust told me what to buy and I bought it and they set it up for me. But there's a lot of complexities to all of this, yet the services of, say, you know, an elementary school and a road and your defense agency, that has to be based off a violent monopoly, but all of these other services can be done voluntarily. So I, I think that it's uh, an artificial distinction without a real justification for those services um, being delivered in that way. And then on top of that, I would say that, you know, look, you could, um, you could certainly write uh, a novel about how scary it and, and I haven't read that book, so I don't, I'm not like commenting directly on it, but you could write a story about how scary it and, and awful and, and burdensome it would be to have like a different, you know, um, uh, you know, like every, every little neighborhood having their own government. I could also write you a pretty scary novel about what it would be like to live under a government, you know, and there's, and, and history has lots of pretty scary examples of living under governments and how bad they can get. I would say that we live, so let's say in the United States of America, obviously there's, this is under the umbrella of the federal government, but there are different laws across uh, every state has lots of different laws. I'm not tremendously worried about that as I travel from state to state. Um, it would not make sense for it to be designed in a way that you were like in a ton of trouble just for entering New Jersey. But then when you got back into New York, everything was OK. And I don't think there is much reason to believe that if there were instead of 50 states, let's just start with going to 150 states, that that problem would get much worse. Right now, we can go through the United States of America, and it's pretty well accepted. You know what I mean? Like that you know, you're kind of allowed to do the similar type thing that you're allowed to do. And then for other issues, there might be some questions like, am I allowed to, you know, make a right on red here or whatever? Um, but I, I think that even traveling um, between different uh, nations has become largely more of a hassle 
in the last 50 years than it ever was previously. And that's been because of the centralization of power and the growths of those governments making it more difficult to leave and come in. So I, I just think that both in theory and in terms of like, you know, the, the practical reality you're going to be better off with more decentralization. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no scenario in which anarchy could be bad or decentralization could be bad, but I think that the likelihood of it going bad is way lower than the likelihood of a, of centralized power going bad, which has happened a lot more often. Uh, I certainly agree that centralized power can and will go bad. There's no doubt about that. Um, what I'm trying to figure out is, is libertarianism the worst of the systems uh except for everything else you know, the worst system except for everything else or is uh democracy the worst system except for everything else because when i look at history history is a, a john mearsheimer stamped parade of realpolitik and you don't have to read many books about the mongols before you realize oh dear lord there are people that will come through your village and they will rape and kill and just take everything from you. And so thinking of this as an evolutionary inevitability, it seems like we are always going to end with centralized power where we make the trade off for, I'm going to give up a ton of freedom in exchange for security. And once I make that trade that slowly over time, the government ossifies, it takes too much, you end up in the debt cycle, which we've already talked about. Like that feels like what I know about humans, that that is the inevitable loop that we will always live in. And so it makes libertarianism, anarchism to me feel like a thought experiment that, yeah, if I could program out some of the human tendency where a, a typically strong guy with uh, just sociopathic tendencies, uh, he's going to come take your shit. And all of a sudden you're going to be like, well, I don't want that to happen again. And we find ourselves back here. Well, okay, so I probably would have agreed with you um, before uh, guns were widely available. But I do think that that changes that equation entirely. And once you've got something like the United States of America, where you have, even with uh, these large centralized governments, even with them, you have something, I don't know if anyone exactly knows, something like 400 million guns. In the country and if you could imagine you know if we're talking about libertarianism or even anarchy here if you could imagine abolishing all gun laws tomorrow you're going to have a lot more uh guns out on the street and this makes this makes um self-defense much more um of a tenable idea like like much more of like oh it's not that there would be these communities who are entirely vulnerable to a bigger stronger guy coming in and taking all their stuff they would actually be able to defend themselves in terms of like, uh, look, do things inevitably lead to centralized power and to giant powerful governments? Uh, look, there's a strong argument to look around and say, well, hey, that's the situation we're in now. But I would, I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to just buy into these inevitability arguments. I mean, again, you know, I use the Soviet Union as as an example before, um, where it certainly seemed inevitable that the Soviet Union would exist forever. And, you know, that it wasn't. And, you know, my, a good friend of mine, Gene Epstein, who's a brilliant economist, he would always use the example um, of, uh, of slavery. And where he was like, you know, if you were sitting around in 1845 at the height of slavery, and you were to say, hey, in the next 20 years, slavery is going to be totally abolished in the West. It, people would think you were insane. I mean, that, that literally would have made no sense. People have been like, listen, this is inevitable. This has this institution has been with humanity for all of its history. It is the way of the world. There is no way all of these people are going to give up on their free labor. And yet, miraculously, but it really did happen. And, you know, okay, yes, obviously there was a civil war in the United States of America. Most other Western countries didn't require a civil war in order to abolish slavery. It's, it's debatable. Maybe we didn't need to have one either. Um, but the fact is that the, the institution of slavery was abolished. And uh, again, people could argue that it was transferred into other forms or whatever, but still, I'm just saying for the, the, that really awful thing went away and didn't come back. 
um, at least for a while. And so I, I just, I'm a little bit hesitant to, to buy into this, like, well, it's just inevitable. Um, the, the truth is that the United States of America was the largest experiment in free markets and in individual liberty in the history of the world. And that doesn't mean it wasn't a perfectly free market country ever, and it wasn't a perfectly libertarian country ever. But there, if you look at the period of time between like the, uh, um, the end of the Civil War and, say, the Woodrow Wilson administration, so from 1865 to 1910, or something like that. You had this giant country in the United States of America that had no income tax, no central bank, no federal regulation to speak of. Um, the, the total spending from the federal government was like 2% of the national income or something like that. I mean, it was by today's standards would be the most radical bare bones government. You know, like you could, you couldn't even imagine if someone proposed today to just be like, okay, year one, we're going to abolish every single department that we have here. We're gonna, you know, I mean, like there were, none of this stuff existed. Um, and in that time of like radical, by today's standards, radical laissez-faire capitalism, we built up the the most powerful country that the world had ever seen. It was the the largest rise for the lot and life of the average person that had ever been seen in world history. Two levels of what 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 would have been perceived as magical levels of prosperity just a couple of generations before that, and so. Uh, look, it's it's very hard. The, the, the primary reason I think it's very hard to get from here to there is that there's so much concentrated power who benefit off the status quo and they would lose their power if they were to, you know, if we were to embrace libertarianism. Um, but it's just so, it's like, it's kind of been done before. We have way more technological advances at our disposal now than we did then. And I think nothing's inevitable. And so it's worth continuing to try to push for that. I I agree that um, nothing is inevitable, that things are... Actually, I don't agree that nothing is inevitable. I do agree that you should approach the world as if nothing is inevitable. Um, but I also agree that looking at history, it's it's going to offer you something because you have tens of thousands of years of these tests being run, and you can see, at least for recorded history, roughly what they look like and... Um, I don't see societies going libertarian uh, at scale. Again, I, it, maybe it works when you're small, but there's a question to be asked and answered, which is why do people tend to form larger and larger societies? Now, again, I'm not even saying that's good, but here's my thinking on why this happens. So to me, when I look at society, it is the answer to the question of what do weak men want? Uh for two reasons. One, they either want to choose to be weak so they can focus on something else, so they don't want to have to develop their physical prowess to be a Spartan, to constantly think of being ready for war. So I won't even use weak as a pejorative. They just don't want to spend their time doing that, right? Like, I don't consider myself war ready. Uh, so I, there are other things I want to do. And the other would be to specialize, right? So I want to specialize, but that means that I need to be in a larger group so other people can do their specialization and hopefully I can get really, really niche and do something that I really enjoy. So we just see that over and over and over. Okay, so uh, maybe not inevitable, but it's certainly something that we see people forming into. So now to, I guess, really make this concrete, and I'm, I actually don't know how you're going to answer this question. So this is a very, very ser sincere question. If you look at something like Israel, Gaza, and what's going on there, um, if I were to go and pull the um, Palestinians aside and be like, all right, here's what you have to do. You've got to band together. You've got to have one vision. You've got to get everybody on the same team. You guys have to decide what you're going to do, whether it's war or peace. Like This has to be a really galvanized uh, energy and effort. It is not going to be um, a bunch of like hyper fragmented groups that they're going to have a way harder time. I'm going to want to give them one narrative, uh, some mythology that pulls them together, uh, a single aim, something that we can build towards metrics that we can count. And so all of those are centralizing forces. And 
That's one I'd be very curious if you think a libertarian approach there would be more effective. So, okay, so it's an interesting question. I would just say that there's, a, there's, and this is a, a point that Frederick Bastiat made um, in, in his work, um, but there, I, I just want to be careful to not kind of conflate society and the state or groups of people and the government. Because there is a major difference there. And so I do think essentially that you are right that we we um we bind ourselves together in groups so that we can specialize and so that we can be more prosperous. I mean, that's a big part of how prosperity happens, is that you stop, you know, you you become more and more specialized, and then you trade with other people who specialize. And obviously, like, you know, if we just go to like way back to the state of nature, if you have to hunt your own food and build your own furniture and knit your own clothes, you're doing everything not very well. And it's taking a lot of time to get it all done. But if you're just like an awesome hunter, and somebody else is really awesome at, at knitting clothes, it's much more beneficial for you guys to trade that type of um, that type of like kind of coming together is heavily incentivized. Uh, because it makes you all more uh, prosperous and can be done voluntarily. But in terms of like the government being much more powerful, that isn't something that I, I and I think this is something that people have a tendency to look back on, you know, Murray Rothbard is like a really brilliant historian and economist. He he wrote a lot about this, but people tend it's like we tend to tell ourselves stories. And one of the stories will often be that if something was one way before and then it became this way, we go, well, we all decided to make it this way. And that's kind of the way the story is told. You you can particularly see this uh, when progressives argue about why we have a regulatory state or why, why we have an EPA or why we have all of this. They'll They'll kind of tell you stories like they'll be like, well, we used to not have one and then it was a disaster. And so now we have one because we know it was a disaster without one. But if you actually look at the actual history of almost any of these things, it's not 100% true, but it's like 99.9% .9 true. If you look at how a government regulation came to be, it is almost never the case that all of the people stood up and just demanded that the government come in and regulate this bad businessman who was doing something bad to them. What it is almost every single time is that special interests from within that sector lobbied the government in order to get them into the business of regulating that sector, usually to make it harder for their competition or to give them some type of competitive advantage. Um, it's, it's not the case that like, you know, um, whatever, the, the all types of different examples, you can look at this uh, throughout history. And so I would just I would be careful from telling the story that in any way, we decided to have a more centralized government or something like that, that wasn't a decision made from the people. And there's really fascinating history uh, about this. But believe me, John D. Rockefeller and JP Morgan did a lot more deciding about having strong centralized government than like the American people at some point just deciding that they they wanted that. And obviously, there's it's a little more complicated than that. Like people were propagandized. There were groups of people who were calling for more government. But really, it, in terms of what actually moved the needle in these cases, it's like, but as you know, today, you know, what Goldman Sachs wants the government to do, believe it or not, has a little bit more influence than like what me or you might want the government to do. It, as far as, um, you know, talking about the situation in Gaza, I do get your point. Yeah, there in many ways, it would be better if we could get everybody on the same page, at least in terms of strategy um, to just be like, hey, listen, OK, I know you want to resist. Here's the smart way to resist. Like the way you're resisting is not helping you guys at all. So maybe this way would be a lot smarter. You know, there, there's a, a fair point to that. I would just say that is that is that achievable at all? But well, number one, part of the reason why you would want that is because they're currently under attack. You know, and and so that changes the calculation. That's not necessarily something you would want at, at in peacetime everyone to be acting exactly the same way. You'd kind of want people to be pursuing their own interests. But regardless, it's like the question really comes down to like, if that is desirable, is it achievable? And what's the best path to achieve that? Because currently Hamas is like the gang with the most power there. And they're pretty into enforcing their will on other people. 
And even that doesn't seem to be working out very well. It's not like Hamas ever really had control of the Gaza Strip. They're, they're kind of like a gang. They'd kill the people who were in their way or whatever. But I just don't know that, you know, and even when, um, you know, even when the Palestinians were trying to play ball more, um, it, it, it was never, but you'd have some who wanted to negotiate. You'd have some who wanted to fire off rockets. And, you know, I don't know whether it's possible at all to kind of get everyone to buy into one strategy, but I don't see any evidence that forcing them to do it is going to work better. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you definitely want the consent of the governed. This is where all of this stuff really starts to break down. For me, the reason the exploration is interesting is I look at America. Uh, I share a lot of the deep concerns that you have. I look at a couple things. One, the nature of the human mind as manipulatable. And I look at the nature of... Um, the cycle that a governmental body runs through and how it tends to either uh, ossify and it just becomes so rigid that it breaks or it becomes so corrupt that it becomes like a gigantic cancer that can't do the things that it's actually meant to do. Um, yeah. And I think obsessively, because I actually, by my nature, I'm optimistic. And it's interesting, people that have followed me for a long time feel like I, I gobbled an entire pharmacy of black pills. <laughs> uh, because as I orient myself to, uh, basically, I succeeded in the system. So the system worked extraordinarily well for me. And when COVID kicked off, and I suddenly needed to orient myself to help people that I, because I didn't understand money printing, so I thought, oh my God, all these people that I've just been working side by side with in the inner cities, they're about to get absolutely demolished because they don't understand money. They don't know how to save. Uh, they don't understand entrepreneurship. So they're really going to get brutalized by this. And um, I started learning about finance so that I could help them. And because I know how to make money, but I never understood investing money or the nature of money. And it felt like somebody lifted up a curtain and I got to see behind the curtain to see how the world really works. And so uh, the largely the focus of the show has become that because if you don't understand how the world actually works, then you're the mark. And in trying not to be the mark, I'm trying to figure out which of these things make sense in theory and which of these things make sense in practice because I would very much like to find myself in a situation where we can, because uh, it isn't 100% of the time that you have the debt problem that we have that you end up with bloodshed. So there, there is some narrow window that we can go through where we can unwind this in a more sensible path. Uh, but I want to find out what those real strategies are. Um, yeah, so that's why exploring the edge cases, whether that's what's happening in Ukraine, what's the real nature of that, uh, whether it's what we're doing with the debt, what's the real nature of money printing and all that, whether it's what's going on in Gaza. Um, libertarianism's not something that I um, have a great degree of understanding in, but while I understand the principles, I worry that in in a fight, maybe is the right way to think about it. In a time of peace, yeah, like when you have a high-functioning country and you want to subdivide it even more, like I get that. I'd rather see that happen, like stronger states' rights than suddenly Texas isn't a part of the U.S. and you know there's some crisis and bloodshed over that. Um, that seems like a, a pretty horrible outcome. Um, knowing the weird year that we're in right now, uh, what what do you see in the near term moving forward? Does the 2024 election go well? Uh, is it is there literal bloodshed? I mean, we had an attempted assassination on uh, a former president. What do you see in the near term? Man, that's a good question. And it is tough. This is a tough one to predict because it's so unlike anything I've ever seen. And even literally just uh, on my way uh, here before we recorded this show, I just watched RFK drop out and, and endorse Donald Trump. And so there's right away, there's another like kind of X factor that I w wasn't, you know, I guess I'd, I'd been thinking a little bit over the last couple of weeks, but I certainly wasn't taking that into account a month ago. Um, and uh, especially after just, you know, as we're recording this, it's just yesterday was the last day of the Democratic National Convention. And 
this whole convention was like unlike anything I've ever seen before. And so we're kind of running through a real, a, a very interesting test in how propaganda works and how the machine works. Um, there's something really fascinating about this to me that I don't know that I completely understand. You know, I'm uh, uh, to some degree outside of political tribalism. This is something that I get both criticized for and complimented for. I'm not sure if I deserve either, but I'm not a partisan at all. I'm not even a partisan to the Libertarian Party, and I'm a member of them, but I just don't. Sometimes I'll support people not in the Libertarian Party because I think partisanship is stupid. Um, but there is, as somebody who never really, uh, never supported Donald Trump, certainly never supported Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton or any of those people, it's it's kind of wild to watch where there's been a lot of people, one of the major criticisms um, from Democrats of like MAGA people is that they're a cult. Like that you're just, you know, you're just, blindly following Donald Trump, no matter what he does. And there is at least a kernel of truth to that accusation. I mean, Trump kind of has a cult like following and people really do love Donald Trump. And I've, I've certainly found myself on the other end of some angry Trump supporters when I've criticized Donald Trump for something I don't think he did a good job in. And they will, they do defend him with a blind loyalty, at least a lot of them do. That is off putting to me. However, I must say, I find the cult of the Democrats to be like a thousand times creepier. Uh, there's something so much creepier to me about worshiping a machine over worshiping an individual. And the way that they're able to like pull Joe Biden out and put Kamala Harris in, and there's not one person in the United States of America who's like, now I, I can't support her, could have supported Joe Biden, but can't support Kamala Harris. Like that person does not exist. And they count on that. They just totally know that's true. Joe Biden, uh, six weeks ago, these people would have given that reaction to Joe Biden. Th this week, Joe Biden speaks on Monday and it's like, hey, get out of here, old man. And no one even cares. No one even cares. Uh, say what you will about the Trump supporters. Try pulling him out and putting someone else in. They'd be like, nope, we liked that guy. We don't like this next guy. And you'd have a, even if they got another good Republican who MAGA kind of likes, if you pulled Donald Trump out and put someone else in, you'd be like, I don't know, are they going to get 50% of Donald Trump's voters to vote for him? Maybe 60%. But there'd be tens of millions of people who would like wouldn't go along with that. On the Democratic side, it's like... There's no one. It's just the machine. If they had not, if they had picked Gavin Newsom instead of her, the exact same reaction would have been there for Gavin Newsom. If they and and there's something really so anyway, I'm getting away from your question, but my point is I'm almost watching this like a science science experiment at this point. And I'm like, how far can they actually do this? Can they actually take someone who none of you liked, who we all would have agreed six weeks ago, we all would have agreed, pretty unimpressive person. But now she's a rock star. She's a beacon of, of joy. She's a phenomenon and all of these things. It's like, wow, can they actually make that happen? Um, and then, you know, I, I just think there's major questions over whether Donald Trump would be allowed to, to get into the White House again. I mean, are we really having free and fair elections? Uh, you know, okay. according to YouTube, yes. And I'm not allowed to question that. But you know, what's what's rattling in between my ears? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. And there, I mean, look, this, I'm not trying to say anything that I don't know. And for people who do follow my stuff, I'm not like a conspiracy kook. Um, I don't just like jump on conspiracies if I don't have solid evidence that they're true. But everything we do know about that last assassination attempt is pretty wild. And pretty, you know, enough to scratch your head and go, wait a minute, what, what? Like, I mean, of all the the targets, if you're if you're a, in the Secret Service, of all of the different people, Donald Trump has to be the number one who you're like, listen, this guy is the most likely to deal with this type of thing. And you know that the entire establishment has been stoking hatred for this guy and that half of the country hates his freaking guts with a passion and not like in the same way that like, yeah, there's a lot of people who hate Joe Biden, but no one on that side kind of feels like if Joe Biden was gone, then the problem's gone. 
Just like no one feels that way about Kamala Harris right now. No one thinks if she's gone, then the problem is gone. Everyone knows that there's just another one of her waiting right behind her. But on the other side, they do at least seem to have the attitude that like this guy is the problem. And if he were just gone, we wouldn't have this problem anymore. That is essentially the CNN MSNBC narrative that democracy is about to be obliterated all because of one guy. And if he just wasn't there, we would, this would all be fine. And, and so in that environment, you're telling me that this kid is on videotape scoping out the roof for over an hour before he gets up there. And then he's allowed to get up 130 yards away from the former president and have a direct shot while people on the ground are screaming, that man's got a gun. And like, the, and the president isn't rushed off state. And, and again, just coupling that with all the other things they've done to this guy, I'll just say it's, it's just starting to look like what it's, what it looks like. And so Will they try again? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe they will. Or or maybe something else crazy happens. So it, it, the long of the short is there's just so many variables this time. I have no clue. I My gut tells me that the whole Kamala Harris thing is astroturfed and fake. And that if there was a real fair election today, I think Donald Trump beats her. But I could be wrong about that. And I, in some ways, maybe we'll never find out because I don't know. I don't know that there's going to be a free and fair election. Now, when you say that it's fake, in what way? Just that the um, the the beast, the machine, the blob, whatever you want to call it, of the mainstream media is so behind her and so painting her so perfectly, asking no real questions uh, that people are just like, "Word, I have my shortcut. I know what to do. I know how to vote." Yeah, I mean, I think there's like, there's no question that there is like tremendous relief amongst people who uh, are, are Democratic voters, because they were kind of being forced into this weird emperor's new clothes game for a while where they had to, you know, pretend that they didn't see what was right in front of their face. Um, the, the crowd reaction, by the way, at the uh, at the DNC when Biden spoke was weird. They kind of had a weird reaction to, and these are like rah rah cheerleader events, you know. And as he's speaking, you could feel the tension amongst the crowd because it's just like a reminder. It's such a crazy reminder to them. It's like, hey, yeah, remember, remember last month when you had to pretend you didn't see a problem with this guy? As like he is, he gets up there and he's not, he's not even like somebody at a nursing home. He's like the guy at the nursing home who's not doing very good. Like, he's not even doing good for a nursing home. I mean, it's really something. Um, and so I think there's relief amongst people, but I don't know, man. I mean, and look, I don't really know what the answer to this is. I can tell you that they keep coming into me. I've gotten like 30 to 40 text messages about Kamala Harris since she's been the nominee. And I don't, I, I've only, I donated to Tulsi Gabbard's campaign. It's the only time I've ever donated to a Democrat ever. I don't even know how they get my number, but there's, I know that there was something, uh, there, there was $90 million that was immediately, it was, was held back from Biden and then immediately released into Kamala Harris's campaign after that, uh, after his resignation or whatever exactly that was. And that she's and then since then she's raised I think over a hundred million more and they say a lot of it's come from small donors clearly a lot of it's come from big donors and then I've seen some of these like investigative reporting going around saying like yeah there's a lot of people who are on these small donor lists who claim they never donated anything to her I don't know I I just I I can tell you that I feel when these propaganda waves come on mm -hmm. and we're in the middle of a big propaganda wave and it's almost like it you know like okay you know when the war in Ukraine first broke out and how every single person would say unprovoked, like Hillary mm. Clinton and Joe Biden and the, the um, uh, everybody, every powerful person, when they talked about it, they always start with the word unprovoked. Vladimir Putin led an unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And after a while, you're like, why do you have to keep saying that? Like, it's almost like your own guilty conscience in some weird way. Like, you have to say that because otherwise we might all learn that it was, you know, it's like um, I, I the example I like to use is like, it's like if you came outside and there were like some of the kids in your neighborhood and like a dog bit one of them 
And you were like, oh, what happened? And they were like, okay, well, we weren't throwing rocks at the dog. And then the dog bit us. So we were just right here, not throwing rocks at the dog. And then this dog just bit us. And, and we were just hanging out, not throwing rocks at it. And like, by the fifth time, you're like, I think you were throwing rocks at this dog. Like, why do you keep saying that? And in the same sense, it's like, they have to keep telling you how much energy she has and how much everybody loves you. It's just very clearly like you're trying to will this narrative into existence. Uh, to what degree they'll be able to do that? I, I don't know. I'm kind of surprised they've been able to do it to the degree they have already. Man, I think it's going to work. Uh, I think it's going to work extraordinarily well. This is... Uh, if you've ever heard Eric Weinstein talk about the idea of kayfabe and how uh, if you consider yourself tribally a Democrat, you were having a hard time uh, when it was Biden because it was just so obvious. I remember, like you, I, I'm not on the side. I just want to know who's going to lead the country to the goals that I think are um, going to lead to human flourishing. That's my shtick. Uh, and I was at the debate uh, for RFK where Trump and Biden were off on their actual debate stage and then he had hired a space. So I'm there. It was legitimately depressing. It was just boring. They were like Biden clearly just wasn't uh, wasn't capable. And you hadn't heard all of the people going, oh, my God, this is obvious now. So I'm just like, I cannot believe that they're going to be saying that this guy was fine. Like this is bananas to me. And then RFK at least had substance, uh, which was interesting. But the the whole thing of it was um, this maddening sense of being inside of uh, the Truman Show. And yeah. sure, I'm just an extra, but it's like I'm so aware that I'm a, a part of a TV show that I'm just like, God. So then when everyone flipped on him, the way, the speed with which, the veracity, the language, I was like, this was planned ahead of time. Like it had to be. It was just all too similar. And I'm sure you have seen the supercuts of like, this is bad for our democracy. This is bad for our democracy. Or this is a threat to our democracy. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over. All the same exact words. It, it's, it is a exploitation of the fact that humans are tribal. They are manipulatable. They want to be manipulated, they want to believe. Like, just give yeah. me the words I need to say because I already, I'm prescribed to being a Democrat or Republican or whatever. So they they want you to give them the way to beat somebody in a debate. And once they have their words, which is why the mainstream media just repeats like simple phrases over and over and over. So it's like, you have them. Oh, and here's just a stupid statistic. Something that rhymes is like 70% more likely to be believed to be true. And anything you repeat goes up dramatically in perception of truth, even when people know it's a lie. If they've simply heard it over and over and over, there's this process in the brain called myelination. So you make a stronger connection of memory with that thing so that it's calorically easier to remember that untrue thing. And that creating that super highway creates the sense of like, oh yeah, yeah, this is true. It, it, is, it is people's limbic systems being knowingly hijacked, but they're, and this is the worst part, they're giving them the thing they want, which is please just tell me what to say to uh, my mother-in-law who thinks that uh, she loves Trump and I just need to tell her that Kamala Harris is better. I just give me, give me the talking points. And so it, it works so well, especially if you can capture the energy. That was the thing that I thought was yep. very impressive was the ads were dope. Uh, the music was awesome. It felt upbeat, energetic. Like they just really leaned into all the youth and vigor that had been drained out by Biden. It's crazy, but I think it'll work. Well, it's it, okay. So there's a lot that's really interesting there and particularly just like the way that propaganda works. And this is what I was kind of alluding to before, but the, the, they study this stuff and are really, really good at it. And there's a reason why, because it's very effective. I would also say that there is even outside of politics, right? And this is why I'm somewhat sympathetic to people who fall for this stuff, because there is, you know, for all of us don't know anything about the vast majority of things. And in order for us to survive, 
we, as, as we were talking about before, we get into specialization and with that comes expertise and with that comes trusting experts. And I certainly do this constantly, you know, I mean, like there's whatever it's like, I, like, I'm not handy at all. Um, but you know, my hot water heater broke down the other day and I, I do realize when the water isn't hot anymore. And then you call your hot water heater guy and they're like, well, you need a new hot water heater. And I'm like, yeah, it looks like I need a new one. Like, I don't know, maybe I don't need a new one, but he told me I did. And I have to trust him. And I do this constant with my mechanic, with my, you know, like with my plumber, there's some million different people. I'm just kind of trusting and they have the expertise. So I defer to them. And so I understand where, and even in those fields too, you know, we all have this, uh, this, this type of thing where like, if you just learn something and then someone asks you about it a few days later, you might present it as if you just know that, even though you just found it out like a few days before, cause we all kind of have our own narcissistic, you know, thing. And like, you're kind of like, Oh, I like to sound like I know what I'm talking about or whatever. And so when it comes to politics, most people have a lot of other things to worry about and God bless them. You know, thank God everybody doesn't obsess over politics the way I do. Cause we would all starve to death if we did. And um, you know, it's good that other people are focusing on making food. Um, but you know, you turn on CNN and a guy in a suit who's an expert is talking to another guy in a suit who's an expert. And it feels a lot better for you to just remember what they said and then go say that to your friend. And now you kind of sound like you know something about it. So there's that aspect of it too, just regular human being, just how we are with everything, except this one area happens to be particularly corrupt and filled with liars. But so the flip side, I would just say to what you were talking about before, which is again, what's so fascinating about being alive today is that so you have this um so say there's the tactic right of repeating things over and over again and before say the internet you might not have even noticed it like even someone paying attention you may not have noticed that like they're saying the same exact thing in the same you know michael malice uh who you mentioned earlier he was the first one to point out to me i thought it was a really uh great observation he goes uh this was back when joe rogan was getting uh viciously attacked over taking ivermectin and he goes notice how they all say horse dewormer mm. there's like five thousand things that ivermectin does they picked this one and every single one of them will say it over and over again, horse dewormer, horse, horse dewormer, horse dewormer. It's like they, they drill home this one thing, you know what I mean? But now, so in the 90s, if you were just watching CNN all day, you just kind of leave and you're just like, oh, horse dewormer, huh? You know, but now you see a compilation on the internet and it's almost like their own weapon gets turned on them mm. because now you can use it to unprogram someone and go, yo, what are the odds that they're all saying the exact same thing? I mean, I was just talking about it the other day. It's amazing. We, you watch Bill Clinton, uh, one of the best public speakers, you know, in, in the last 30 years in American politics, in the last 50 years in American politics. And he's up there. And in the middle of this, this Bill Clinton speech, he just goes, and Kamala Harris brings joy. And you're like, oh, what a shocker that you picked the same word. What a weird coincidence that you had the exact same word. You also thought joy, you know? But so, and then, uh, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll wrap on this, but one of the things that is interesting to me, if, if you kind of zoom out a little bit, is like, okay, so the George W. Bush administration lied us into war in Iraq, and they... Like the, the case for this is undeniable. They knew Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction. The neocons in his administration had been trying to fight this war since well before 9-11. They knew he wasn't involved in 9-11. They even wrote in a project for a new American century that they would need another Pearl Harbor type event in order to get the wars in the Middle East that they wanted. So they, they just lied through their teeth. Now, what were the consequences of that? I mean, aside from the war and the hundreds of thousands of dead people and the trillions of dollars wasted and all of that, the, the consequences were enormous. I mean, like the, you have conservatives today who have no trust for the FBI and the CIA and the military. That, that was unthinkable 20 years ago that you'd be in this situation. And so a lot of these government lies, especially on massive issues, they have, they have slowly and then all at once eroded trust. 
And, you know, I remember because I was I was totally against the lockdowns at the beginning of COVID. You know, I had easy priors to be against the lockdowns. I'm a libertarian and I think government's corrupt and people ought to be free. So it was pretty easy to be against the lockdowns from my perspective. But I remember getting so much pushback from people about how dangerous this was to not be for lockdowns. And when it really when the floodgates really started opening and people really started listening to me about it was when the Black Lives Matter protests happened. And the entire media flipped on a dime and said, no, 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 now you can go outside. Now you can go outside. It's okay because you're protesting racism. And it was like, however you feel about George Floyd, however you feel about Black Lives Matter, however you feel about COVID, that's bullshit. You know what I mean? Like it's bullshit that because of science, yesterday you had to stay inside, but today you can go protest racism, you know? And so there is this thing where the more desperate they get with the propaganda, it can also backfire now. And so that's the that's the thing that's really fun to me. It's like, yeah, this is why I'm not as convinced as you that it's going to work. It's like, yeah, maybe, maybe it will. But there's a whole lot more people aware of propaganda now. And especially with the internet, it just gives you this tool. It's like now, like the son who's on to all this stuff can go talk to his mother and father and be like, you know, they're playing you. Oh, and by the way, here on my phone, here's a clip of them all saying the exact same thing. You see what they're doing to you? And so I just think we have a fighting shot to beat this thing in a way we never did before. Yeah, I'll agree with that very wholeheartedly, which is why I do my podcast like you. I think people do respond to ideas. I just think that it the, the political machinery is probably right. You're really all pitching to the independents. So you're pitching to the small group of people who will actually take in new information and make a new decision. I am just terrified by the number of people that either are manipulated and don't realize they're being manipulated or the people who actually want to be manipulated, which is a very fascinating thing. There's a an old 80s song by the Eurythmics, uh, and the line is, some people um, want to abuse you and some people want to be abused. And I always thought, whoa, that is dark, but nonetheless true. All right, man, I have to ask, now that I have you on in particular, um, help me think through Israel, Gaza. Um, what I really want to understand are the base assumptions that drive your thinking. So I've watched a lot of debates on this, and what I find is people don't argue at the level of base assumption, and so they end up, um, uh, take Norm Finkelstein when he was on Lex with uh, Destiny. And what was driving me crazy as a viewer was Norm said, uh, Israel shouldn't exist. The state of Israel should not exist. And every word out of his mouth after that is simply in line with that. And so if you don't go, okay, well, if if it just ought not exist, then the only thing that we should be talking about is either me trying to convince you that it ought to exist or mm -hmm. us talking about what we do with the fact that it exists and we have to, in his paradigm, unwind it. But of course they don't. They just go back and forth about what deal was offered when and all that. And it's like, Norm has been very clear. His base assumption is it should not exist. So as you, somebody who's not partisan, as you think through what this very complicated conundrum is, what are the, I mean, handful, I would assume, of base assumptions that you have that guide your thinking? Well, I guess my starting point is more that, um, that people have rights or that people ought to have rights, and it's immoral to violate the natural rights of human beings. And that includes, you know, the the right to live your life, uh, to own property, to um, not be killed or or, you know, uh, injured or things like that, unless you're initiating violence against somebody else. So that is kind of my starting point for all matters po political is like self-ownership private property rights, and the non-aggression principle. And so that's what I, that's how I try to judge all of these conflicts, including um, the the one in between Israel and the Palestinians. I do not agree with uh, Norman Finkelstein on, on that. I'm, I don't remember that part where he actually said Israel shouldn't exist. Um, it was a long debate though. Uh, but I would, I, I do agree though, that let's say the way Israel was founded was was illegitimate and immoral. I think that Norman Finkelstein and I, you know, he's a very uh, left wing, um, I think, 
socialists type. And I'm a like hardcore laissez faire libertarian. And so I do think while we, you know, and, and I've learned a lot from him and he has like an encyclopedic memory of every UN resolution that's ever been passed on the subject. And it's, it's very impressive. Um, but I do think that there's probably some fundamental disagreements there. And so in a sense, you know, I would say, look, even if you want to say what the Europeans did to the Native Americans was horrible and was illegitimate at the time that it was done, my conclusion from that would not be, therefore, the United States of America shouldn't exist and we should all go back to Europe or something like that. It's like, I don't think that's right. I think the fact that um, injustices have happened in the past it shouldn't warrant injustices uh, happening in the present or in the future. However, I would say that to the extent that there are Native Americans still around, which there still are some, uh, they ought to have their full rights protected. And so I would also uh, likewise say in Israel, I don't think it's practical um, or morally correct that Israel should cease to exist and all the Jews living there should like go back to Europe or something like that. But I do think it should at least be acknowledged that the way Israel founded the country involved violating a lot of Palestinians' natural rights. And at this point, you got to stop doing that and you got to allow them to have their natural rights. And, and that means either a one-state or a two-state solution. Um, I'm kind of open to either, although I personally tend to, to lean toward a two-state solution. Okay, um, that certainly all makes sense to uh, me as somebody who's on the outside of this and that I haven't studied it nearly as much as you. Um, what is the pushback from people who are being sincere, not bullshit pushback? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I guess I, I do generally speaking find that the, the pro-Israeli side of the argument typically relies on a double standard in terms of the value of Palestinian life versus the value of Israeli life. And I do think they, t they tend to rely on a kind of very one-sided rewriting of the history, um, which is, you know, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm trying really here to take on the best argument and not take on the worst argument. But I mean, I'm, I'm just sure. saying that like in, I mean, I've been in debates where people have presented it as like Israel never did anything wrong. And the Palestinians mm -hmm. were always just the aggressors and Israel was always just defending themselves. I think that probably the best version of the, uh, the other argument is that, um, well, Israel has to do whatever they have to do to defeat Hamas and they, it's, it's horrible that they have to kill these innocent people uh, along the way. But if they don't, then more innocent people will die as a result of that. I think it's pro or, and, and, you know, they have to get the hostages back and they have to have a full surrender from Hamas. Uh, the, I just, that's kind of the best argument I could think back. And I think it's a very flawed one. And the, you know, I think that um, there's certainly no guarantee that more people would die if Hamas is short of uh, being completely annihilated. Uh, I don't think, as all the intelligence reports seem to indicate, it's it's possible for Israel to um, uh, el completely eliminate Hamas short of killing every man, woman, and child in Gaza. And um, and I think that this type of uh, military campaign is is likely to produce a lot more Hamas or Hamas-like groups. Okay, uh, is this a moral uh, a framework that you use to assess the conflict? Yes, I mean there's there's a there's a practical component to it as well, but yes, I would say primarily it's a moral component. Okay, and uh, when you go into the practical component, what framework do you use? Is it like realpolitik? Is it diplomacy? What's the framework? I mean, I, I think that the framework would be um, what's best for the United States of America, what's best for Israel, and what's best for Palestine, um, with primarily what's best for the United States of America being my, my primary concern. What is our interest in this? Well, um, you know, there's, in, in actuality, 
our interest is that um, number one, there are th the same interests that support all of these wars, like war. Um, there are people who are ideologically um, very, like on a foundational level, who are in very powerful positions, believe that protecting Israel um, and protecting Israel's interest is the most important thing that the United States of America can do. Um, and I think there are also... Do they give uh, reasons for that? Because so... Um... I'm I'm not so new to this that I don't have um, you know, an understanding of basically what's going on. But the one thing that I have not spent any time researching is um other than that this is a very long-standing ally, and I certain hey, if we've told somebody we're gonna do something, we should do it. That to me is um Going back to this is a moral thing. If you tell a friend that, I, hey, I would, if XYZ thing happened, I will show up for you and you don't show up, that's bad from my moral calculus. Um, well, I mean, unless but, you're telling a friend you're going to do something really, really immoral, then maybe it's better to break your word than to do that immoral thing. Well, I would hope that you just never offer to do something immoral and that's sort of mm. part of the pact because then we can tease it apart right so you're taking a moral lens on this and so that it makes it very easy to start asking those questions i will give the us that um it's just understood if you're doing something that's immoral we're not going to back you um so i think these are tease outable things so for now i'll say uh the moral lens is the right lens that the U.S. is um, not going to do something they think is immoral, but this is an ally that they have made a promise to. They don't yet feel that um, we've gone uh, so far past whatever gray zone that this is obviously immoral, because I think the Biden administration even is hedging their language. Please tone it down. Please don't do this. Like They're, they're saying those things, so I don't want to um, pretend they're not. So I get it. It's going to be super gray. It's not you know, just a, a super clear-cut line. But anyway, that um, moral framing, they are there to help an ally who they don't believe has gone too far, if you will. But what I don't understand is, um, and I just don't understand, what is the historical relation between the U.S. and Israel that has brought us together so closely? Is it just that it's the only democracy, uh, Western-style democracy in the Middle East? Well, that is certainly what a lot of people say, um, that it's the, the only democracy in the region, and so we have to support them. Um, there's, I've heard people make arguments that we have a lot of common enemies, and therefore that's why we have to support them. Um, I've heard people make arguments that, you know, there's a, they're a good trading partner, and uh, we, you know, our militaries help each other and things like that. Again, I just think... Um, I think all of these arguments are very, very flawed. Um, and that's not out of any like hatred of Israel as a country or certainly of a, a hatred of Jewish people or anything like that. But I do just think that there's the, I think all of those arguments are wrong. I think essentially Israel is not a democracy. Um, they, they, you kind of, I mean, they are a democracy inside Israel proper. Um, however, you know, they've had control of Gaza and the West Bank since 1967. And none of those people have any voting rights or any rights whatsoever, for that matter. And I just don't think, you know, I mean, maybe you could get away with that for like a few years after a war, you occupy an area and then turn it over to them being independent. But if you've kept an area totally controlled, for you know since 1967 and none of those people have any voting rights at all i i don't know how you can consider yourself a true democracy i think the the term apartheid state makes a lot more sense okay and do you believe the narrative that israel does not want to be controlling that area they would rather be hands off i know i think it was back in 2005 they withdrew and it's like, hey, cool, you guys do your thing. We're just protecting the border. Does that narrative just ring completely false? Yeah. I mean, you know, like I think if you don't want to be occupying an area, then, you know, well, they're sure going about it all wrong. 
if they really don't want to be occupying that area. And, you know, the the pullout in, in 2005 is totally, um, let's just say what actually happened there is much different than the way it's spun by a lot of pro-Israeli people. And it is true that they ended the military occupation and they um and they ended the settlements in Gaza. There's something I I'd have to double check the numbers on this, but if you go check it, it's something like eight thousand people uh, that they pulled out of those settlements. And then in the next year, they put like fifteen thousand in the West Bank. And they then you you can read about this in their own writing, where they essentially said that they were like, well, the whole you know the whole purpose of this is to freeze the peace process because now we can say, Hey, look, we gave them their own state here in Gaza. And this way we can keep building up in the West bank. It's if you, if you, uh, go, go, uh, search, um, uh, Smotrich, uh, Google Smotrich and, um, uh, formaldehyde. As he said, what we're doing here is essentially putting the peace process in formaldehyde. And yes, it's true that since 2005, Israel has not, technically militarily occupied Gaza as they had from 1967 to 2005, as they do from 1967 to this day in the West Bank. But they put a total blockade around the country and they they control who and what goes in and out. They control the airspace, the sea space. I guess there is no airspace anymore because they don't have an airport. Um, they they control how far you the you can fish off the coast of Gaza. I mean, they have they have the thing under complete control. It's as Sheldon Richman uh, put it, where he said, "It's as if the prison guards all left the prison and surrounded the prison, and then they said, look, we freed everybody.' But that's not really freeing everybody. That's just imprisoning them without there being guards in the prison." And so, no, I don't think there there has been a ton of deals on the table over the years to give the West Bank and Gaza some degree of autonomy. And the pro-Israeli side will say, well, it's these the Arabs just always keep turning down the deals and we offered them all these deals and they keep turning them down. But at the end of the day, you don't really even need a partner to stop occupying a place. You could just stop occupying them. And so I don't I don't buy into it at all that they really sure do hate that they have to do this, but they've just had to do this for over 50 years. Do you think that the Israelis believe that um, the Palestinians are a security threat? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, ab absolutely. And, and the I mean, you know. When you say the Israelis, there are obviously like, you know, we're collectivizing here and there's there's people sure. in the, you know, there's the, the war cabinet and some soccer mom are not all the same people. Um, I sure. think it's I think it's pretty uh, it, it's probably widely believed and for good reason that there are legitimate security uh, concerns. Terrorism is something Israel has been dealing with um, since its inception, essentially. OK, um, the base assumption that I run about why the uh, the right wing coalition that Netanyahu represents uh, wants to put it on formaldehyde, wants to sponsor Hamas, wants to make sure that they stayed in power long enough. Maybe he even turned a blind eye. My thinking won't change whether he turned a blind eye or was completely um, taken off course, but that he because he believes that they're a security threat of significant enough proportion that they have to be um, dealt with in some way, that um, that drives all the thinking. Now, the policy might be a terrible policy, but if I'm right about the underlying base assumption, I at least then understand, meaning I can re-articulate their decision-making process, not that I agree with it, but that I can re-articulate their decision-making process. Do you think there's anything else um, underlying that that keeps them wanting to blockade? So they're not the prison guards aren't in the prison, but they're still standing outside the prison. So um, okay, so there are these hard right wingers in Israel. 
a couple clicks to the right of Benjamin Netanyahu, who he's now allied himself with. Um, a lot of this is because he had he had lost all the liberals so badly that he kind of had to ally with some of the more far right wing uh, parties. Their constituencies, which are a minority, to be sure, in Israel, they, I, I think, are largely motivated by religious uh, beliefs. And they believe that Judea and Samaria, as they call it, is supposed to be part of Israel. Um, and there's a lot of their holy sites and stuff are in there. So I think those guys are largely motivated by wanting the West Bank, by wanting the West Bank to be part of Israel. And of course, Netanyahu did show up to the UN a couple weeks before uh, October 7th with a map of Israel that included the West Bank and Gaza, all as Israel. But they certainly don't care about Gaza as much. They really care about the West Bank. That's why the settlements continue um, to this day in the West Bank. And so I don't think exactly that they are first and foremost motivated by the security concern, although uh, the security concern is there and it is real. I mean, it's not as if there aren't Arab terrorists who are trying to kill Israelis. Benjamin Netanyahu, I've always thought, is more motivated by... Um, by kind of not that it's a religious thing with him, but that it's more like a legacy thing that if he gets the West Bank is part of Israel, then he goes down as the next great Israeli prime minister and, and all of that stuff. Now, I'm not saying the security concerns don't play into this, but the truth is that Benjamin Netanyahu up till October 7th, at least in his rhetoric, was almost always downplaying the threat of Hamas. We can control the height of the flame, was what he bragged to his other, uh, you know, Knesset members there, um, uh, or his other Likud party members in the Knesset. And so I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's true for certainly for a lot of the Israeli people. That is a major concern of theirs, and understandably so. I mean, these are people who, you know, lived through the Second Intifada. The, the, many of them lived through October 7th. You could understand where their concern would be uh, security issues. Um, th this was also the concern of many of the people who were opposed to abolitionism uh, in, in the United States of America. Many of the people who didn't want to abolish slavery said that they had real security concerns, that if you freed all these slaves, all these people you've been enslaving for so long, they were going to try to kill you if you gave them their freedom. I mean, I can also understand why they had those concerns. You know, like those are legitimate concerns. Uh, the thing is that you just go like in the uh, it's an old Thomas Jefferson quote, right? Which he said, uh, I always butcher this. I bring it up a lot, too. But where he said, uh, we have the wolf by the ear and we can neither afford to hold on to it nor to safely let it go. And that was him talking about the slavery dilemma. It's like, well, what are we going to do? What, are we going to make them all citizens? And then they have Second Amendment rights? You're telling me these people we were just enslaving can go buy a gun now? They're going to come kill all of us. And you could understand where that's a legitimate concern. But any decent person looking back at that now also recognizes that you go, yeah, but you can't enslave people. You know? So I do think there are security concerns on the Israeli side, and I think even legitimate ones. The thing is that, you just, you can't hold the wolf by the ear forever. And at a certain point, you got to just you pull the bandaid off and say like, okay, we're not going to be in the business of occupying other people anymore. Yeah, it's interesting. And look, everything is so different and I fully understand that. But given what happened in Japan and uh, Germany in World War II, the fact that even with all of the horrendous atrocities, um, we were able to help rebuild and then get the hell out. So um, look, there's geography concerns. Well, I don't know That's about why the, I was asking about get, that. I don't know about the get the hell out part, but we did help uh, rebuild. I think we really? still got do you troops. Feel like we, I think do we, we still got we, troops in Do we in have areas. anything you would consider an occupying force in Japan? No, I'm not suggesting uh, it's it's an occupying force exactly, but uh, I'll just say that the military presence in in Germany and Japan, the get the hell out part comes a lot later than the uh, the rebuild part is all I'm saying. But no, I'm not, for, I'm not really for taking sure. issue. Yeah, that that that'll open a can of worms that uh, unfortunately I know we don't have time for. But the the one last thing that I want to map your uh, base assumptions around is the argument that you're going to hear a lot is the um, lack of moral equivalence between what happened on October seventh, which is a barbaric act of terrorism, 
uh, versus a military response to a barba barbaric act of terrorism plus them um, having hostages. Uh, does that make sense to you? Does that ring hollow? Is it, yes, that's the right way to think about it, but the response is just disproportionate? Or how do you think of that? No, I mean, I, so I understand it. And it, it does make some degree of sense to me, but I think it's the wrong way to think about things. And I think that uh, on a, you know, on a human level, there's sometimes more advanced societies and more advanced governments. What they end up doing with it is they they institutionalize things um, and they they make things much more advanced and less primitive and barbaric. And so it's very easy to see, you know, say like if you're, you know, if if you're driving around in Mexico. And this is kind of a famous thing in Mexico, right? That if you get pulled over by a cop, you can often just throw them a few bucks and they'll leave you alone. And it's very easy for us to look at that and go like, look at the corruption down there, you know? And clearly it is a much more corrupt system. It's a much more nakedly corrupt system. Um, our corruption comes in different forms. Now, if you get pulled over by a cop in the United States of America, probably don't try giving them money. That, that's almost certainly not going to work. That's just not the way our corruption works because our corruption isn't primitive and barbaric. Our corruption is more like um, the prison guard union will lobby to keep mandatory minimums for marijuana. Now, that's a much more sophisticated form of corruption that doesn't feel quite as gross and primitive but it's on a much more enormous scale. Right. And the result of it is that people's lives are ruined over something that is clearly very, very corrupt. Every bit as corrupt as paying off a cop to leave you alone. And you can argue much more corrupt. And so on a human level, I understand where someone breaks out of their cage and comes out to like just rip apart any person that they come across. That feels a lot different than like someone pushing a button and sending a missile into a building that kills 40 people. Even if that guy only killed 15 people, it still seems much more primitive and corrupt. And th there's not nothing to that. Like, you know, if you, if you had to go out to lunch with like an IDF pilot or a Hamas terrorist, you'd probably pick the IDF pilot. Like that's a more civilized person who is kind of doing a job and can probably compartmentalize that and not be a monster at home. Whereas I'd imagine that Hamas terrorist is probably unable to compartmentalize that and is probably a nightmare to live around or to go to lunch with. However, the fact that this terrorism, if you will, is so much more sophisticated and so much more systematized does not really remove from what it, what it is. And, you know, as somebody like I have two little children, um, I think that most people out there who have kids or maybe have nieces and nephews or like some kids, you, you know, it, if somebody were to kill your kid, I, I, I don't know that it would be like, it would be of much, uh, relief to you to find out that like, don't worry, it was just collateral damage in a strike. Don't worry. We just, we knew your kid was in that building, but we knew a bad guy was also in that building. And so we decided to blow up the whole building, you know, for, on the other side of that, it's still the same thing that happened to you. Like the same crime is the same crime that happened to you. And so there is this kind of tendency for us to even like, even to look at things like terrorism versus collateral damage. Uh, you know, what do you call it here? Look, if if there if there was a really bad guy um and he was a murderer and he went into a, a school and you know he's using them as human shields or whatever, you know, and he's hiding behind all these kids. And then the local police department came in and just blew up the school and killed all the kids. And the we wouldn't sit here and go like, well, that's collateral damage. And uh, hey, it's on this guy because he was using a human shields. We'd be outraged at the local police department. And we would be like, you guys are a bunch of monsters who just murdered all of these children. Now, I understand for practicality reasons, things are a little bit different when you're dealing with conflicts within, you know, a police force's jurisdiction than within different territories. But in terms of the moral act, 
like if you're on the other side of that, if you for a second put yourself in the Palestinians shoes, you can understand where that's just like a totally unacceptable thing to say to them. Like, no, it's terrorism when anyone breaks out of Gaza and kills people in Israel, but we can absolutely decimate Gaza and you'll just have to accept that that's, that's just collateral damage. I think that's an unreasonable thing to ask a group of people to accept. Um, I get why it's unreasonable to ask a group of people to accept it. And I think that you have accurately identified that um, not only will it just be totally meaningless to them, whatever weird distinction you're trying to make, you're also going to create more people that will hate you and they will come and kill you later. And so from that perspective, it's just a god awful strategy. Uh, and I know that you heard um, Coleman Hughes address this on Joe Rogan, but I found his argument pretty compelling, which is that um, this is actually Hamas is very intelligent. You can think what you want, but it is a an unbelievably effective strategy to turn the uh, Western world against Israel to um be willing to let your people die, to not want them to leave because you know they're going to be bombed, to have specifically done this to court a response, and that you want the footage of um, the women and children just being slaughtered endlessly. Um, that's a that's a really smart strategy. And if we go, well, we're just going to let them get away with it and because we're afraid to kill them and to have this footage and quite frankly, just to do such a horrible thing, um, then they can, you know, peck us to death forever coming over and doing these pot shots, killing a hundred here, a thousand there, 500 here. Um, it would really be the perfect get out of jail free card. And I don't see how you can let that stand. Yeah. So, but that's yeah, but I mean, I I think there's a there's a false binary being created there because it's not a Please. choice between doing what Israel is doing and just letting them get away with it. I mean, it's like, look, after not look, this is this is the true this is true with all terrorism, with all asymmetric warfare in general, that they're always trying to to prod you into an overreaction because that's the whole game, right? Like Osama bin Laden didn't think he could take down the United States of America by knocking down the Twin Towers, but he did think he could get us to invade Afghanistan and bankrupt ourselves just like they had done with the Soviet Union. And so, okay, so the answer then is to not invade Afghanistan and bankrupt yourself. But that doesn't mean you couldn't have done the special ops uh, attacks that took out 90 plus percent of the Al Qaeda bases, which is what we did immediately after 9-11. By Christmas of 2001, almost all of Al Qaeda in uh, Afghanistan had been destroyed. We then invaded the country and decided we were going to fight a regime change war against the Taliban, which went on for another catastrophic 20 years. So the look, before Netanyahu, the Israel always dealt with their terrorism problem with targeted assassinations, special ops, things of that nature. They never dealt with it as just a problem for the regular old military to go in and just totally decimate the place. And so, look, nobody's suggesting that you shouldn't find and target the people who were directly involved in October 7th. No one's suggesting you shouldn't do everything you can do to get the hostages out. But if the game from Hamas was that, which I think it was, I think Coleman's correct about that, was that we're going to provoke Israel into this overreaction that will turn world opinion against them, well, then they certainly didn't have to do it in this reckless of a way. And and who knows how many of their own hostages Israel's killed? I mean, they admit to a few, but who really knows when you see these cities destroyed? What, uh, who's really accounting for where all the hostages were? Um, I think that, it, again, it's, it's not a choice between, oh, we do absolutely nothing and let, let them get away with that, or we level the place. Um, the truth is there were a lot of different possibilities for how Israel could have responded to this, and almost all of them would have been a much better idea than what they've done. So is your base assumption that uh, keeping with the things that Netanyahu has said himself that have come out, that um, he wanted this frozen peace, he wanted a moment to be able to get rid of them, that really it was just this attack happened to meet a threshold where it was like, okay, now we can do the real gloves off and get to what we really want, which is just the the total um, decimation of Gaza itself. You know, my my best understanding of the situation is that Netanyahu's plan for propping up Hamas was that um, he would thwart the creation of a Palestinian state. 
and it would kill the peace process. And then he could embark on negotiating with the other Arab countries without ever having to make a deal with the Palestinians. And he essentially felt like that was working. And he, in his own words, Hamas was the, the fire which, whose flame they could control the height of. I don't think October 7th was part of the plan. I think it has totally decimated his legacy, and he knows that. And now he's in this desperate game of, number one, trying to, be, you know, it's like, it's not like 9-11 that happened, like, on George W. Bush's first year, you know? Like, he's the longest-serving prime minister in Israeli history, and it just happened at the end. This is his, like, and he is the guy who took the hard approach that we're going to thwart a Palestinian state and we're going to prop up Hamas and all of this stuff. I think he realizes his, he's politically done after this, and so now he's searching for some type of victory, and he also knows that as soon as the war's over, he's over. And so he's kind of got to keep the thing going. So I don't necessarily think it's as sinister as, like, he wanted this war all along. I think he had awful reckless policies that ultimately culminated in October 7th and is now in a politically impossible situation and seems to be, you know, as uh, as John Mearsheimer has pointed out, seems to be almost um, in some type of like psychotic self-destructive spree here there that he's unable to like pull himself back in from. And how do you make sense of the fact that the um, that Hamas won't give back the hostages? Oh, I mean, I I think that it's as easy as um, look. That part of it is is what you and Coleman were just saying that they they see this as a victory. They think that they're turning world opinion against Israel, and they are. Right? They're not wrong about that. Um, and then also, I think part of it is that that is that's the leverage that they have. So they're trying, I mean, there's been all types of like negotiations going on and there is, there's there been some of them that are probably the fault of Hamas, some are the fault of the Israelis, some are the fault of the Americans. But Hamas just uh, the other day, it was reported, said they would work out a deal to return the hostages, but they didn't agree to Israel's terms. So I think they do see this as their last bargaining chip, which it kind of is, and they're trying to get the best deal they can. Mm. Brother, th this is a much bigger conversation. I know that we are out of time. Uh, hopefully this is the first of many. Thank you for walking me through um, all of the base assumptions. I think it is a super uh, helpful way to really map somebody's thinking. Uh, where can people follow along with you? Oh, um, uh, part of the problem dot com is uh, where my show streams. If you want to support us, you can you can go over there, and then it's uh, of course YouTube and Spotify and all the other places that you can uh, you can get internet shows. Um, and Comic Dave Smith, if you want to come see me out on the road, uh, that's my website. I love it. All right, anybody that's uh, deeply invested in the Israel Hamas Palestine. Uh, drama, please forgive that I know we are just scratching the surface and there's much more complexity that we did not get into. I do not consider this a full, full exploration, uh, <laughs> but did want to start the conversation with Dave. So thank you guys uh, for sticking with us this far and hopefully there will be a part two at some point in the future. All right. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe everybody. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. If you like this conversation, check out this episode to learn more. First of all, to answer your question directly, destabilizing the United States would be very difficult because at the end of the day, the U.S. is a, we are a strong unifying culture. When we are attacked, it supersedes all other things. That's that we saw that with 9-11, we saw it in the Vietnam.